the 357 SIG versus the 9mm Luger. We're talking about concealed carry cartridges and we're going to get right to it right now. Hello friends and lovers, this is Dave Trillo and you're listening to the Ammunition Guide podcast brought to you by none other than Ammo.com. Now, uh, I told Chris if we compare one more cartridge to the 308 win, I was going to rip my hair out. So he said, Dave, let's talk about the 9mm and the 357 SIG. Now, I got a lot to say about the 357 SIG, but we got to start with my biggest beef of all, the name. Because Uh no other cartridge is ordered, misordered, I should say, more frequently than the 357 SIG. But there is a reason it's named that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, SIG wanted to basically make the 357 Magnum and put it in a semi-auto handgun, essentially. Now, of course, everybody down in the comments, and by the way, if you're in the comments right now, make sure you click on that link down there, get on our mailing list and get a $20 off coupon. That's free for all of our subscribers and viewers here. Uh, It's just our little gift to you. But if you're down there in the comments section saying, wait a minute, Chris, there are already semi-automatic handguns chambered in 357. You're right. The Desert Eagle is ready to go. But for those of us who can't afford a Desert Eagle, which is me, uh, and maybe you want that power, the 357 SIG was what it was developed for. Well, Chris, the 357 SIG, it was, like you say, developed to uh, pretty much replicate the the terminal ballistics of the 357 Magnum, which is a revolver cartridge, isn't very practical for law enforcement applications. Uh, this thing can punch through car doors like they're made out of graham crackers. Oh, yeah. And they can neutralize the F out of a threat. Definitely. I mean, there are some, you know, higher end law enforcement agencies that still utilize the 357 SIG, such as the Texas Rangers. So, I mean, if it's good for Walker, Texas Ranger and Chuck Norris, then I mean, there, there has to be some credence to this caliber being, you know, pretty powerful. Yeah, it's not remotely <clears throat> bad at anything it does. Oh, no, no, it, it's very powerful. And you know, don't get us wrong here when we're we're talking about this, and we have some critiques that we're going to levy against the 357 SIG. It's not a bad cartridge at all. It definitely can get the job done, and it is basically built to replicate the ballistics of the 125 grain jacketed hollow point that made the 357 Magnum as potent and as powerful as it is. Yeah, I mean that's enough gun no matter what you're talking about it's uh it's going to get the job done but like we've alluded to already that revolver is just not very practical if you need to reload during a firefight it's going to be hard to get the guy to uh you know take five while you pull out your moon clip right and that's really what we saw like in the 1986 miami shootout uh probably one of the most famous uh law enforcement shootings of all time where really brought on the necessity for the 40 Smith and Wesson. And this was something that uh, Dave and I were talking before we started recording that, you know, SIG really was just late to the party uh, making the 357 SIG. Yeah. Yeah. Smith and Wesson introduced the, uh, the 40 S and W, which of course is basically a shortened version of the 10 mil Mm -hmm. and became extremely popular quickly, which is great. You love to see it, but SIG came to the party after the 40 S and W had already made pretty big inroads into the consumer and law enforcement markets. And I, the thing is, I don't know if it gives enough to make them give up their forties. And that the answer really is it doesn't. Uh, now, one thing that I did forget to mention was the secret service uh, still carries the 357 SIG in their SIG P229 uh, handgun. So that is one law enforcement agency that still offers or still has that as their duty issue. Uh, you know, handgun and and handgun cartridge, but it just, in my opinion, the 357 SIG doesn't give you enough to justify it if you are already using a 40. I have heard cops who used the 357 SIG on duty point out a really neat benefit, which we often think of as a disadvantage, Hmm. and that's the uh, the muzzle flash. They say this thing pumps out so much light when you fire it that just the muzzle flash itself is enough to make a perp stop dead in their tracks, deer in the headlights style. 
Well, I mean, I guess if your your perps are whitetails, then maybe that might be enough. But I would hope that your shot placement would be good enough that you don't need to worry about muzzle flash to stop your assailant. Oh, yeah. Ideally, you'll hit the guy. But I definitely like the philosophy of such an intimidating cartridge that it's not to make the guy give up and repent and go to community college right there on the spot. Right. It's, it's the shock and awe concept, right? We use that in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's just this on the streets, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, of course, uh, you know, like you say, you know, you don't really want to count on intimidation alone. You actually got to hit the guy and to that. And the 357 SIG is extremely accurate. Oh, yeah, it will definitely do the job. And I think one of the benefits it has for accuracy and consistency is the bottleneck cartridge. Now, I'm going to critique that cartridge case here in a little bit, especially when we get to the reloading portion that I love. Yeah, you don't like it because you're a hand loader, but for normal oh, yeah. people, that's not a huge problem. No, it really isn't. If you don't hand load your own ammo and you just buy all of your stuff and shoot it once... You don't need to worry about that at all. But uh, it does offer, you know, a very nice supported chamber, uh, you know, with that bottleneck cartridge, very uh, accurate, very powerful. But, you know, does that mean that the nine millimeter is not accurate? No, by no means at all. Now, the bottleneck, um, very, very rare for mm -hmm. pistol rounds. I can think of a nine millimeter Makarov and nothing else is immediately coming to mind. I understand the two key advantages to that is uh you know it kind of focuses the energy of the propellant gases kind of constricts them and makes you know enhances the rounds muzzle velocity and also that that shape feeds more reliably into a chamber it definitely does like, isn't it the 762 tokarev that was the bottom that's line? what i meant yeah forgive me yeah that's okay it's like okay I say, they're so rare we, we it is never deal with them ever it is. It's much more common in rifle cartridges. Uh, you think about your 223 Winchester or, you know, your favorite cartridge, the 308, which we've been talking about quite a bit here uh, on the <laughs> Ammunition Guides podcast. Uh, but yeah, it really, it, it allows you to be a little bit more efficient because with a straight wall cartridge, you know, your base of your bullet is going to take up some of that case capacity being you know, pushed in there on top. Whereas with the bottleneck, it allows most of that base of the bullet to be contained in the bottleneck portion of the cartridge, allowing for more case capacity. Yeah. And it does funnel the, the propellant oh, yeah. gases in a little bit too. Am I, am I huffing glue when I say that a bottleneck pistol round feeds more reliably? No, I don't think so. I've, I would say that I would agree with that. It's going to be a smoother entrance into the chamber. Uh, I don't think that you should have uh, any issues. Now that being said, Straight wall pistol cartridges have been, you know, commonplace since the early 1900s when the 9mm Luger was introduced. So, uh, you know, there's not really going to be feeding issues either way, but a, a bottleneck cartridge is a very smooth feeding cartridge. The 357 SIG, to its credit, it's a little more accurate than a 9mm, although I'm not sure it's going to make a noticeable difference over the ranges that handguns are fired. I agree. And, you know, accuracy is one of those things that is very subjective and it's all about the shooter. Right yeah. now, if we plugged it into a vice uh, and, you know, did that, then, yeah, we might be able to get a more quantitative, uh, you know, evaluation of accuracy. But I uh, don't think that just if you ha can't hit the broadside of a barn with a nine mil and you go out and buy a 357 SIG, you're going to be a bullseye competition shooter. It'd be nice if it's that easy. Right. That would be nice. Always blame the gun. It's the gun's fault, right? It's never the shooter. Yeah. Or my ex-wife's fault. Absolutely. Definitely. I'm, I'm on board with that one as well. Uh, now, but I, we don't, yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, we don't like the phrase stopping power because mm, it's mm -hmm. not one, one quantitative property a round can have. But if we're just talking about muzzle energy and how much force this bullet can dump into the target, and the 357 SIG once again beats out the 9 mil in this situation, right? Oh, without a doubt. That 357 SIG is really going. Uh, and it can really hit your opponent pretty hard. But it's one of those questions like, what stops a threat? And this is something that is highly debated in, yes. in the firearms and community. And you throw out the word stopping power on any internet forum and you might as well put your flame suit on because it's going to be on at that point. Everybody's going to be going back like, no, this one's better. No, this one's better because of this. And mm -hmm. the, the question comes up, is it because the shot placement was better or because the bullet hit harder? And it's really hard to really determine whether that's the case. But 
As far as muzzle energy is concerned, yeah, the 357 SIG is going to win by a country mile. And whereabouts does its uh, muzzle energy fall into? I seem to remember the low 400s. I mean, if it's apples to apples to a 357 Magnum, then it should be in that neighborhood. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I have to say, I have to pull this up. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I know. They, you got me. You got me on this one. Yeah, so it's about 500 foot pounds of energy uh, for, you know, that 357 SIG where, you know, your 9 mil probably clocking in hmm, right around 400 or so. Mm -hmm. And for context, they recommend at least 220 to 300 foot pounds of energy for self-defense. Absolutely. So within the ranges, they're designed to be fired over. Neither one is going to put insufficient energy into its target. So I Definitely. guess it's kind of a draw there. In my opinion, yes. I think I think it all comes down to shot placement, to be honest with you, Dave. I think if you can put that bullet on target, you know, in center mass where it needs to be or in the fatal tee, uh, if you have to make a, you know, a headshot, then it's not going to matter which bullet you pick. Uh, it's going to get the job done. Hmm. Point. Yeah. So the big glaring problem to me as cool as the 357 sig is is finding the damn thing yeah ammo availability is a little bit tricky whereas with nine millimeter i mean you can throw a rock in a gun store and hit a box of nine millimeter yeah it's the most popular center fire pistol cartridge in the world Definitely. Uh, you know, law enforcement, military, civilian, concealed carry, or if you just like to plink around at the range, you can't beat a 9mm if you want to shoot a handgun because the ammo is so cheap, it's so prevalent everywhere, and you can pick mm -hmm. up components if you want to reload. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but the other beauty uh, of the 9mm is the recoil is so soft compared to the 357 SIG, which is about twice as much. Yeah, that's amazing to me. Well, it's like you said, with that bottleneck cartridge, it's forcing all of that, uh, you know, that power, that pressure into one spot. And you're basically getting a 40 Smith & Wesson pressure wise in a nine millimeter cartridge. Uh, and that it, it makes for a pretty snappy shooting experience. Let's put it that way. So whereas with nine mil, if you get a nine mil, you're going to be able to get really, really relatively comparatively for, for our times, cheap ammo. Uh, you yeah. know, you just plink with and not care about mm -hmm. 357 SIG, man, I don't think you're going to get that for less than a buck around at the moment. Yeah, it's pretty expensive. And I have to, it is running right around a dollar per round, if not more, uh, depending on what brand of ammo you decide to buy, which you should be buying all of your ammo here at ammo.com, by the way. Oh, certainly. Definitely. But, you know, price wise, you can get nine mil for about half what you can get 357 SIG. Hmm. Yeah. And there's no like just real, you know. Cheap ammo that that misfires a lot. I always thought it's kind of good to train with that on occasion because mm, it teaches you how to quickly clear out a jam. Yep, uh, absolutely. 357 SIG ammo, to its credit, it's all pretty high quality because they know that their market is law enforcement who are paying you know tax dollars on their ammo. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So we... there's no no real cheap like you're not going to get Turkish made 357 SIG. That's true. You're not going to get that uh, that steel cased 357 SIG that uh, you know some shooters really love uh, to go out to the range and plink with. That costs you feels like pennies on the dollar compared to 357 SIG. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been using a case of 7.62.39 to uh, oh, nice. put my computer on while I'm working. It's great. It feels there you very go. official. Definitely. Yeah, it's not exactly uh, architectural digest, but. <laughs> What are you going to do? Hey, you know, whatever works. Uh, I mean, you know, that that's a definitely a new use for 762 by 39. I got to give you that one. Well, thank you. Hey, no problem. I think the, the one thing that is kind of nice is you're typically not going to see any difference in price as far as handguns are concerned. I mean, you look at something, you know, like a Glock, it's going to be like the same price for, you know, a 9mm Glock versus a 357 Glock. If you start getting into the SIGs or the other, you know, steel or aluminum frames, uh, you know, semi-automatics, then yeah, they're going to be a little bit more expensive. But for the most part, uh, handguns are going to be comparable between the two if you really want a 357 SIG. Yeah. No, I think a Glock 32 is fundamentally the same thing as, as you know, your 19. Oh, yeah. Or definitely. 17. 
Mm -hmm. And you should have, uh, you know, it would be a very comfortable concealed carry. They use the same size magazines. Uh, so, you know, you wouldn't have any problems as far as that's concerned. Uh, but where it does come down to it, in my opinion, and I alluded to this earlier, is with the reloading. Uh, now, you, everybody who's been watching this podcast knows I'm an avid reloader, reloader. I love it. It's my thing. And the one thing that has been pushing me off of investing in a 357 SIG is having to lubricate those cases when you resize them. Uh, this is something that you have to do with a bottleneck case. Otherwise, it'll get stuck in the die. Uh, and then you could potentially damage your dies doing that, which is not a good thing. And it's just a pain in the rump. I'm not going to lie. And for me, it's just not worth it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'd advise people to damage their dyes, but ammo.com doesn't sell them. So. Yeah, that's true. We don't, we're not in that area no, just yet. There's nothing in it for us. Yeah. But, you know, the, the nice thing is if that's something that doesn't matter to you, I have a good friend who is all in on the 357 SIG, absolutely loves it. The beautiful part about it is you're going to be shooting essentially the same bullet diameter between 9mm and 357 SIG. So you're going to have cross compatibility as far as your bullets are concerned. Yeah, I know the three or the 357 SIG doesn't use the same bullet weights as the nine. Is that a problem when it comes to reloading? Not necessarily. Uh, it depends on which bullet weights you want to shoot. Whether there's reloading I'm data sure for it. I'm sure you can make do with a 124 grain bullet. Oh yeah. That it would take a 125 grain bullet, but they're they're just not 100 percent apples to apples there. That's true. That's fair. They are a smidge different, but for the most part, you could actually get like 147 grain bullets uh, that would be comparable for both. So they're identical, and you know, could you use the point three fifty six diameter bullet in in the three fifty seven sig as well? That should work just fine, if I'm not mistaken. You need to slug your barrel just to make sure that uh, you know that that would work, that that would fit. Uh, but for the most part, you shouldn't have any problem, uh, you know, with your bullets between the two. I gotta say, you know, usually we'll say there's a time and place for whichever round we're comparing to the more popular round. Like all the rounds are compared to the three oh eight kind of had the time and place i can't say there's any reason someone should go out and buy a 357 sig it feels like everyone who orders it from us is a cop or was a cop and wants to use what they trained the most with yeah uh, i agree with you on that i think it's cool but to me it feels like a boutique round it's just like, you know, if you get a 357 SIG, it's because you just really want it. You think it's the coolest thing since sliced bread. And you know what? If that's your thing, then go out and get it. Uh, you know, if you really like it, uh, or if, like you said, if you're a, a law enforcement officer and you need it to practice with, we have plenty of stock available for you here at ammo.com. Make sure you get your coupon down in the comments. Remember that, guys. Click that link down there. Uh, but, you know, it... it I just don't see the need. If you really want something with more pressure, uh, with a little bit more foot pounds, it's a lot cheaper to go with a 40 uh, as opposed to a 357 SIG. I got to ask, aside from its just scarcity and, and lower demand, is there anything about the 357 SIG that makes it cost about twice as much as 9 mil? Honestly, I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, case wise, there's not that much more material involved in it. If I had to guess, it might be the uh, the added machining needed to make the bottleneck cases to start with, as opposed to a straight wall case, which is going to be a lot easier to make. Yeah. But I mean, component wise, no, you're not going to have that much difference. Huh. Interests us just they can't make as much of it. So it's less economical to mass produce it. Well, I, I think there's it. just there's just less demand. Uh, you know, it never really took off. It, it it came in the footsteps of the 40 Smith & Wesson, and it just didn't offer enough to de-seat the 40 from the top law enforcement round. Like I said, there are a couple agencies that still use it, but honestly, those are starting to dwindle, uh, and a lot of them are switching back to the 9mm. Yeah, I kind of anticipate in a decade or two, this one might go the way of the Dodo. It might. It very well might. And it's... The people who love it absolutely love it, and they swear by it. And, you know, I again, I say if that's your bag, then you go out there and you rock it. You carry that thing every day. Uh, you get out to the range and you practice as much as you can so you're a surgeon with that thing. And don't apologize for it. Uh, you know, just because Dave and I are sitting here being like, well, you know, maybe it's not the best choice, doesn't mean that you need to go and sell it. No. Yeah. You know, now, to reiterate, me and Chris know everything. So you well, just yeah, do what we say. That too. But uh, 
you know, you should never care about what other people say. No, man, you, you got to shoot what you love. And that's the important thing. I mean, if, if you like that recoil, if it makes you feel, if it feels good in your hand and you enjoy shooting it, then go for it. Me personally, I'm sticking with my nine millimeter. Is this pretty much, this is SIG's 45 GAP, isn't it? It really kind of is, honestly. And it feels that way. I, I often joke where it's like they, the people at SIG are sitting there looking and it's like, oh man, Smith & Wesson is killing it with that 40. What can we do? Can we get our name on a cartridge? Because we want to have our name on a cartridge. Let's do it. Uh, and yeah. then they you were have that. kind of hurting back then too. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't doing so hot if I recall. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, the 357 SIG just never really caught off uh, or, you know, caught on rather, excuse me. And I mean, yeah, I, I still think it's just a boutique round. People who love their 357 SIG is going to be flaming me in the comments, and that's okay. I can take it. I guess if you want that kind of performance, get a 357 Magnum, keep your 9 mil, and then, of course, order ammo for both from ammo.com. Absolutely, and make sure you click that like and subscribe button down below. Get notified every time we upload new videos here on the channel because we've got a lot of more calibers that we're going to compare, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. So you're going to want to stick around, and we will catch you on the next one. Yeah.